All right, we're live. Soul Brock, it's been, it's been a long time coming, dude. We've been trying to do this for, <laughs> for m probably six months. Months, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad it's come about in this form, though, because uh, it was going to be a podcast and it was going to be maybe in person. But, you know, this is great. Live is great. And uh, always with things that happen or don't happen, it's divine timing. That's what you got to recognize. And this will be, uh, yeah, a great one because of that. Yeah, I'm excited. It's <laughs> no people have to understand though. Like we tried to do this probably six times, and for yeah. whatever reason, just divine timing didn't work out. Um, the last yep. time you were like, "Oh, I got to drive to Mexico or something like that." Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Couple times I just completely forgot. Like, it's it's very funny. Uh, yeah, you left me hanging a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely, did. I definitely did. which I'm not normally like. Like I'm usually, which is like you can. I mean, if you ask anyone, I'm typically extremely on time. You know, it's partly how I was raised and stuff like that. And um, mm. yeah, I Could don't have know. And have. It's not like it's something that I didn't want to do. It's like it's something I really look forward to. It's one of the things I like to do the most. So yeah, All thanks good. to everyone for tuning in right now. Um, we're very grateful. We're excited for this conversation. Um, and and we're going to talk about a lot of different things. I think I titled this a guide to the based. Um, so I just, mm -hmm. I mean, this is going to be on, this is live on YouTube. We have comment sections right now. Post in the comments where you guys are from. I think we can both see that you can see the comments, right? Soul. Yeah. Cool. So we'll be able to see your comments as we stream this. If you're listening afterward, you missed the live stream. That's fine. Um, but let us know where you guys are from and then we'll, we'll hop into it. I want to start off, Soul, by asking you, what do you think most men go wrong with in their fantasies and desires? Right. Great question. Uh, so fantasies, it's kind of a, it gives you a hint right there. It being a fantasy where anything that you conjure up in your mind that you don't have directly, and then you live in that mental state. So there's a delicate balance right you want to envision and have a, a, a like a real um detailed idea and visual imagery in your head of what you want to achieve and put mental energy towards that each and every day think about it dream about it wake up thinking about it um you know putting in the mental reps people don't realize but your body and mind actually adapts to an activity say you're a a, a tennis player if you envision yourself doing a tennis serve over and over again, that contributes to uh, your body actually learning the skill of doing that thing, even though you're not actually doing it with your body. You know, shooting a basketball is the same thing. So there's the mental side of envisioning what you want to achieve, what you want to be good at. All the successful people, you always hear that BS about, well, it's not BS. You always hear that spiel about, yes, when I was 10 years old i was envisioning myself uh picking up this gold medal winning this trophy and now here i am today 20 years later some sort of thing like that so you need a fantasy in the sense that it's a mental picture that you dedicate your mental energy towards uh in order to achieve something you must first create something in your mind before you can create it in real life the issue is when your life is pretty shit and you haven't really achieved what you want to so you would prefer to live in the fantasy of your mind than actually do anything in real life to achieve that. And a lot of people, this is what happens with guys that watch porn. The sexual fantasy is more enjoyable than their own sexual life. So they end up dedicating all their mental energy to this fake thing that isn't real. And there is this, um, my friend Lobo has mentioned this before. It's like anything that you do not have, if you spend your time looking at uh, houses that are, you know, million dollar houses that you'd like to have one day. Um, beautiful girls is one thing. Um, cars and things that you don't have, that is effectively mental porn. It's mental fantasy and you're directing that energy to what's essentially nothing when you could be directing that energy to achieving the things you need to have in your life in order to get those things rather than living out the fantasy of having them as a mental picture on the computer screen. And that's the distinction there. That balance is, is, you know, I would say dedicate a conscious time of the day where you're journaling out what you want your life to look like, 
uh, you're spending time thinking about these things, thinking about the practical skills or situations that'll get you to where you want to go. But past that, don't spend hours looking at pictures and videos of things that you don't have because you're training your brain to get that dopamine release where you haven't actually achieved anything. Like Lobo uh, explains it. He says you should get that dopamine release from having achieved the thing, from walking into your own amazing house one day rather than watching a YouTube video about it. So that's the fantasy side of thing. Um, desires was the other aspect of that question you said. Desires need to be... You can't hold too tightly onto your desires. If your desires do not match up with what you're doing each day, then it's just, again, this fruitless mental endeavor, which isn't going to achieve anything. It's like, I have a desire to be the best sprinter in the world. So how much do you sprint? Or how, how often do you train your sprinting training or, or do weight training that's going to help you sprint? Uh, once a week. Well, then it's not really your desire. Your desire is downstream of what you spend your time doing each day. And that cannot be fooled by anyone and your real desires your subconscious desires what you actually want are going to manifest in your life now becoming conscious of what you're actually wanting in a relationship or a career or whatever circumstances you're in that's super key and unless you consciously write these out think about how you may have subconsciously desired something which ended up blowing up this other relationship you had because it wasn't what you subconsciously desire. It's all about navigating that play, becoming conscious of your um, desires and making sure that you're not living in a fantasy. Otherwise, yeah, you, you'll just kind of flail around with no compass directing you. So what do you think, mm. what do you think are the most common fantasies or ideas that young men think they want that actually leads them to, a miserable life so yeah that's a good one it's a lot of guys will think they want money but money is a tool and money will get you many different things and enjoyable things it's great to have money i love money money loves me you know it's 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 awesome to have but if the pursuit of money that's probably the number one most common one in terms of the young western male who has been programmed to think that and want that if your money comes at a cost of something you got to think about like do you want money or do you want high leverage money that you get from doing something that you're interested in on your own schedule now they're two completely different things the second one where you do what you want what you're interested in you work on what you want with people that you like Whenever you want, you're not answering to other people and get money for that. That's amazing. And money is great in that situation. <clears throat> but if you pursue money, this is the other thing with subconscious desires. If you only want money, you may unconsciously direct yourself into, let's say, an investment banking role where you're working 80 hours a week. And yeah, after five years at Goldman Sachs, uh, killing your body, having no fun or you know, you have your party blowouts because that's the only way of dealing with the stress. But day to day, you're sick, you're stressed. I've seen many friends do this. Um, you don't have time for relationships. You never get out in the sun. It's like, yeah, you've got money, but what have you sacrificed to do that? So the, the main mistake being that there's no specificity and the goals or desires that, and fantasies that have been given to you by a society that may benefit society more, it, it is beneficial for the macro level society to have this worker drone who goes into Goldman Sachs and does 14 hour days every day, doesn't complain, doesn't go off and have a good lunch, doesn't work out every day, doesn't sleep. That's good for them. That's good for the banks. That's good for the financial services companies and you know, input whatever industry it is. Is that good for you? Is that good for what you want and your desires and your dreams and goals? Mm, probably not. So again, it's about recognizing what fantasies and desires have been given to you by other people, society, your parents? You can work your whole life trying to find a goal um, or trying to achieve a goal that your parents want for you. That's never going to work. You're going to break down eventually because you're realizing you're living a lie. You could have been given subconscious desires um, and fantasies from media. You know, the mass programmed media of sleeping around is a big one. Uh, the college drinking, getting fucked up, uh, movies. We've been attacked with that. Every Netflix you sh show you that's marketed to young uh, people these days is, you know, sex, drugs, um, 
you know, being naked at school. Like it's fucked. It's completely fucked. And that is just going into people's minds, um, you know, across the world. And then they think, oh yeah, I want that. I desire that. But really it's been given to them by someone else. Why is an entirely different story, but you have to realize where these desires have been implanted into yourself, take control of that and say, no, actually I'm going to go against the grain and not do what these things are just because, you know, if the society has said so, or some rich and powerful person or celebrity on TV has, has told me that has told me that. And, uh, yeah, that's really important. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit earlier, you mentioned porn, you mentioned <clears throat> this idea of hookup culture and that's, that is partly where I was, uh, leading the witness trying to, to get to, and I want to dive yeah. into this a lot with you. And I think that one of the things that's leading that young men astray is like the desire, the desires that hookup culture brings into yeah. the world. Um, I hate the word hookup culture. I don't even think that really does what we're talking about uh, justice. Um, mm -hmm. Where where do you think hookup culture comes from? Why does it exist? And how is it programmed into young men? Right. So... <clears throat> That's what was the first bit? How, why, what it is? Yeah, sure. Let's define it first. Yeah. What is it? So, I guess what we're all referring to is this idea that um, you don't have to have any seriousness in the sexual relationships, the romantic relationships that you have. And sex is a, you know, not a zero sum game. It's uh, that there's no strings attached. You can have sex with anyone as a casual thing, you know, casual sex. Uh, by definition, it's like sex isn't casual at all. But the acceptance of sex being this casual thing has meant that everyone uh, is now just kind of one risking their health, uh, their mentality and their soul on some level. Because when you have sex with someone, you're entwining souls. That is how powerful that act is, sexual intercourse. So if you're not properly vetting someone that you're having sex with, you don't know their morals. You don't know their values. There's always the potential of pregnancy if it's unprotected or whatever else. Um, there, there are many different things that you have to consider before you actually go and do the most, um, let's say, intimate act you can do with someone. You're going to take their energy on. And on some level, girls receive more energy than guys do in the act. But you're still, if you have sex with someone, then you are imprinting a little bit of them onto you and you may think that it's like casual at that point but everyone knows when they've you know made the wrong decision just because they were thinking with uh, their dick instead of their head and how much heartache turmoil pain would you have would you have avoided in your own life but other people that you know if you had just you know thought with your head or even your heart instead of uh thinking with your dick and just adding a little reverence to this act where you are merging your souls with someone uh in that way and so that that's hookup culture is this idea that casual sex is okay uh there's no consequences to it you can just you know do it for years and years go to college and do it uh and then it's all good the sexual liberation which kind of started in the 1960s um you know this is i guess where it's come from is uh, it's, it's, it's been a, a long time coming and I forget exactly where the research was, but again, my friend Lobo shared this and there was a study done by this sociological, um, professor, scientist guy, and he was pretty much mapping out across all the cultures that have occurred in hundred last couple hundred years. And he, it shows when a, like the, the length of a society, how long does a society survive for based on the sexual dynamics of its population? What he found was that the creativity, the arts, the innovation, all of that is most flourishing and therefore the success of that society flourished the most when people married early and didn't have sex before their marriage partners. So they were just coupling early on, probably strong religious values and casual sex wasn't a thing. When you go to the other end of that spectrum, what you find is the downstream social societal dynamics of uh, casual sex is people having sex with anyone is that the creativity, the invention just goes downhill, you know, and this is and the, the, the society doesn't really last for longer than two generations after that time and time again. 
uh, for whatever reason. There's, there's a lot of reasons within that. But what we're seeing now is, in general, most people would say, oh, yeah, Western society is on downhill, you know, compared to most things. Uh, you know, innovation is, is, is gone for the most part. Um, and people have this general sense of things aren't as good as they used to be. And, you know, there are many, many reasons why they are better than the past. And you should never have that uh, perspective that it is shit or whatever, because in a lot of ways, this is the greatest time in the history of the world for us to be born. So that, that's an aside note. But what we're seeing now is the sexual liberation of the 1960s, um, the, the, the hippie movement, the drugs, all the rest of it. Um, now, two generations later, pretty much everything breaking down and the populations that are being raised now, the generations that are being raised now have, uh, you know, probably the worst sexual dysfunction, the worst social dysfunction that we've seen, um, you know, historically. And that is the downstream effect of hookup culture. And it is, you know, th there's, there's one perspective that hookup culture exists for a very small percentage of men, but a lot of women. And then in general, we're not actually having as much sex as before because people are, you know, being poisoned by endocrine disruptors, um, all the different lifestyle factors. People are just like not socializing. They're on their phones and on their computers. So you don't have those opportunities to actually have sex. So it's the, the several things happening. So it's almost like this hyper perversion of this intimate sacred act that sex should be. But then also people being so scared of and not being able to utilize their sexuality, which should be utilized and promoted within a loving relationship of trust and intimacy. You do a lot of thinking. <laughs> yeah, a lot. I walk a lot, so that happens yeah. naturally, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I like all of those points. It's very well constructed um, <clears throat> with history and everything. That I like that coming from the yes. 60s. So it's, it's kind of like, where does the average guy go in this day and age now what are your choices and really what do you want do you want a, a dynasty do you want a legacy uh if you do if you want to be kind of not for any sense of external validation but you just want something to give to your grandchildren in a way then you need to act in a way that is going to promote a stable loving relationship of a high quality woman that is not going to be sleeping around and all the rest of it. So you have to present yourself as, you know, someone that acts with integrity and doesn't sleep around because you won't find someone that is high quality and doesn't sleep around. If you yourself are sleeping around, that's just law of attraction 101. And, you know, do you really deserve someone that is chaste and, you know, values their sexuality to the point where they're not sleeping around with someone uh, if you are, and that's a mistake that a lot of guys make, especially if they're, let's say high value or whatever, they think it's okay for them to do, but then they don't want it in their girlfriends. And you know, that's fair enough. I've had the same experience, but like at some point you have to realize that if you want the high quality, then you have to also be the high quality and, and girls find, um, promiscuous men different than promiscuous than men find promiscuous women, but there's still that element of like, yeah, it's, it's a little bit gross and you don't want to have those energies flying around if your goal is to have this long-term legacy, build a family unit. Uh, you know, how many people do you know? Maybe you can answer this as well. Think of people's parents, your friend's parents, your own parents. The relationship is one of beauty, respect, integrity, and like a shared vision of the future. It's not very common, right? No. It's, it's, it's barely anyone at all. Like you see... Most couples where the, the guy's like this, you know, oh, sorry, honey, like bumbling fool or the, the woman doesn't respect him. That doesn't seem to be any sexual element of desire and respect and all the rest of it. That is the, I think, would, I would say the average uh, dynamic of, of Western relationships right now. And that's sad. And then that's what the kids see. And then they think that is normal. So that is a result of people not giving the relationship and the dynamic, the time and respects it deserves and not trusting themselves, not, you know, living with honesty and truth about what they want, what they desire and not being the best version of themselves for each other. So 
that is something that's like super important is living in a way that where you have actually earned and deserves uh, this good, good girl. You know, how, how do I find a good girlfriend? Well, you let them come to you in a way by acting in a way that is congruent with a great relationship. You have to be a great man in order to attract a great woman that you can have this, you know, family dynamic with. And, you know, don't worry if you're a younger guy and, and you, you know, a lot of that will come with a bit of age and achievement and success. There is a level of, you know, you have to achieve things as a guy in order to expand your, you know, your dating potential. Uh, so that can happen through your thirties as well. Uh, but I would say that don't let that um, mean that you can't, you know, find, if you find, if you have a girlfriend that's like loving, caring, supports you, uh, you get along well, you have a shared vision of the future. A lot of guys will throw that away because they, they don't either, they don't value it or they just don't respect what it is. They don't know what it is because they've been told like these Hollywood spiels, you know, the, the idolization of people like Leonardo DiCaprio, who could be gay, by the way, that could be an entire op. <laughs> I've heard, but um, Leo, Leo sexual. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, you know, the whole Hollywood mode where everyone goes both <laughs> ways, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And you really got to figure out like, if that lifestyle is what you want, then just realize it's going to come with possibly being 50 or so everyone else having married around you. Not that you should, you know, again, value or judge yourself on what other people are doing, but like, you'll get to that point and be like, dang, like I could have had 20 years with my kids by now. Um, but I was just kind of pursuing these short-term flings where the sexual nature of things was number one priority. And I didn't value these other things. Like if you choose a marriage based on uh, just sexual energy because they turn you on a lot, then that, you know, that, that ends in divorce. You're fucked and not <laughs> yeah. in a good way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Seriously. Yeah. No pun intended. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on this whole uh 1% man movement of like 1% men earn the right to multiple women type idea. Um cuz mm. obviously I mean, you know, I would categorize you as a 1% guy and Thank you. Uh I mean, I don't know if you want to disclose your your status, but I would presume that you are a guy who is looking for a relationship with that is a uh, sexually exclusive exclusive relationship. I have no doubt that if you wanted, you could have multiple girlfriends, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So, so what is your thoughts on that? Um, and I guess, I mean, we could, we'll go and there's a whole another line of philosophy and religion that we can explore, but what are your first thoughts on that current uh, mindset? Yeah. Well, I think I'm seeing someone now. So, uh, you know, exclusively and have been for a while. Um, just to contextualize that. And within that, I've learned so much about myself, about previous relationships, about my you know, family history, which has resulted in, um, let's say, a lack of trust in women in general, which means I was kind of using the attention of multiple women to, previously this is, to uh, validate my fear of being left by the women woman figure in my life right so that power dynamic is flipped where i felt best when i was harvesting the 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 energy of multiple girls and what that's you know that led to heartache and that led to just my mind being messed up and that it, nobody wins in that situation yeah historically there were kings that had multiple wives and all the rest of it but do you really think that the relationship between the king and all of his wives was um you know as deep as it could have been no it's, it's literally impossible is you have a lot of friends then you're gonna have fewer best friends because you know it's the weekend and you're gonna hang out with someone oh, i'm gonna hang out with jimmy instead of fucking ted or whatever um then your relationship with ted is gonna just naturally not gonna have the same ability to get close and spend time with each other that's gonna happen if you decide to go down the multiple women path and a lot of guys are using it as a because they're scared of being vulnerable with one person and getting deep with one person. And that was me for sure. Um, you know, I, I don't want to tell anyone what to do, but for me, for what I want, uh, a healthy family, I want to show my kids what's possible. I want to um, have stability in my own life so that I can expand my entrepreneurial goals as much as possible. 
um, then I, you know, that is the choice that I make to have uh, the one girl who's beside me and, you know, supports me and that's what I want. But there is definitely a movement of um, guys out there that it is possible. But again, it's like, are you really going to make that work for the for your whole life or is it just this um, band-aid cover-up for needing the validation from multiple people? You know, you have to decide that yourself. Mm. So what do you think? Yeah, I mean, to contextualize, I'm also in a relationship. I've met I met the girl that I'm with right now last November, so roughly a, a year. No, yeah, eight, eight, nine, ten months. Um, and I mean, it's beautiful, man. Like I've been in, I've been in a pretty terrible relationship before. So, yeah. um, I know what that's like. I know what, you know, the whole, um, sort of codependent narcissist relationship looks like, and it's not fun at all. It's, it's terrible. Um, yeah. I also know what the hookup culture lifestyle is like. Uh, and the kind of stringing multiple women along while simultaneously, you, I mean, the thing is like, as exactly as you said, if you're a guy who's trying to have, you know, multiple things with multiple different women, and I've seen it with my own eyes, you know, you're yeah. going to be attracting girls that are stringing along multiple guys. I mean, there's, there's a girl I know um, who I actually, I do respect her and I think she's um, a good person, uh, but she was telling me um, this was in, uh, this was in Europe over the summer. She was telling me like, she's talking to like five guys simultaneously. And they're, she's a beautiful girl, you know, and she's actually like, um, she's very intelligent. She's like speak, talking to kind of stringing along five guys simultaneously. Yeah. And I know that, and a lot of them, uh, most of them are celebrities. And it's just yeah. like, <laughs> what, what are we doing here? Like, what, <laughs> what is this game? Um, yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, the, the thing to me that I think is actionable advice that I would pass along on this note is it was completely out of fear, my decision prior to want to have, you know, multiple uh, relationships. And it was something that I, I definitely like um, defined, like I wrote it down. I was like, I want to have, this is like the, you know, the lifestyle that I want to live. I want to have like casual sexual relationships and it was out of fear that um, I wouldn't be able to have one strong relationship. So I just mm. had a bunch that were basically empty. Yep. Right. Because then if they're all empty, you at least get the sex, but then you can't get hurt. So yeah, exactly. So I did that. So, so I actually made a conscious decision um, and it was, it was weird. It was kind of a scary decision to make um, in yeah, roughly around actually October last year, I went to a couple weddings. Um, my two of my really good friends got married quite young, um, 24 right. and 24. Yeah. Um, and I went to the weddings and I just kind of saw it and I was like, wow, this is simple and peaceful. And, you know, I mean, I know that a lot of marriages end in divorce and we could talk about that as well. But I just kind of made the decision. I was like, you know, I'm I'm ready to meet someone that I can commit to. And I just told myself yeah. that. And like very shortly after I just made that mental decision, I ended up meeting yeah. Chloe and you know, she's, I mean, she's just incredible and um, she's incredible in ways that previously I just wouldn't have cared about at all. Like, yeah. And you know, even some of my friends that uh, or, or just people I've kind of talked to, that are sort of still in the hookup mindset, they kind of, they look at it so two dimensionally, you know, they look at a relationship yeah. with a girl. So two dimensionally, it's like, is she hot? Does she like do what you want? And that's it. Yeah. You know, and there's, it's yeah. just like, it's so uh, lacking things from their perspective. And I, I understand. Cause I was certainly in that mindset as well, but um, I do feel like it is. And I don't want to pretend, you know, I'm only 25. I don't want to pretend that I'm, I've like figured it out and, uh, you know, again, a, a lot of relationships end up ending, but um, I think it is a it is a mature step to say, you know, what I'm looking for is a, a strong union with another strong female. Mm -hmm. um, 
and have that like masculine feminine dynamic that like makes you powerful together. Uh, and, yep. and it's been, it's been really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's so you got to think about it in several ways. It's like, would you want your daughter to emulate the person that you are dating? And if your only metrics to have a relationship is, is she hot? And does she let me, you know, does she do whatever I want? Then your daughter is going to learn that. And when it's your daughter, a hypothetical daughter, would you want her to just do whatever men told her to? No, you'd want her to be independent, strong. And those are like mean buzzwords uh, a little bit like uh, strong women, fucking feminism, whatever. But it's true, like in the strong feminine sense that she's powerful and secure in herself, then that's what I want for my children. And that's what I want them to be, you know, safe and secure in their relationships. And if you want that, then you have to show them how to do that with your wife. And there's only so much of beating around the bush and these casual flings that you can do, uh, which, you know, all you have to do is extrapolate um, how it feels after having a casual hookup. And you're like, just want them to leave and you know, not feeling good about yourself. It's like, okay, do I want that on repeat? And it, it's, it's, it's kind of existing in the lower uh, sexual sh chakra. Um, and that's like, you know, like I said, the lower stages of the chakra and it's not allowing that energy to fl flow through up to, you know, all the others. And that in turn lowers your general life energy, which affects your creative capacity to do great things in this life. When you control your sexual urges and you're not just, you know, either masturbating is the most base level, but casual sex is masturbation with someone else in a way, using their body to masturbate. And if you do that over and over again, then you're just expleting yourself at this lower sexual energy level and not going to be able to really elevate yourself uh, in any meaningful way. And so that's another effect of hookup culture is like these, uh, these guys that, you know, have made the... Not... Uh, I made the decision to just keep on, you know, sleeping with girls and whatever. They're actually being played themselves. Is that they're, they're not really opening themselves up to the full capacity of their power within, and that it's just the distraction. Uh, and you're never able, like, if you think about it this way, if you're going up a hill and then you stop, um, you know, a, a kilometer up the mountain, uh, and then just go back to the bottom. That's like starting up a new relationship with a new girl, getting to know each other. And then being like, oh, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm afraid of this commitment or they're not exactly what I'm looking for because I'm envisioning this state of complete perfection where everything is going to be right. And that's not real. That was another thing that I struggled with. It's like, okay, I, I had this, this fear-based mentality uh, around commitment that if a girl wasn't absolutely perfect in every single way, then oh, she's not good enough for me. And that was a way of rejecting them before they could reject me. And of course, no one's perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not the perfect guy. Um, but if, if I can say, oh, I'm not going to commit to anyone unless they literally tick every single box in my, in my book, then, uh, then it's all good. And I'm just going to stay single. And, and of course, you'll never find, literally never find someone like that. And do you want that either? Not having kids? Uh, no, like everyone that I've said, everyone that I've spoken to, uh, that have had kids said that you know my, my life changed when I had kids and some would argue that that's a biological basis and that your body wants you to take care of your genes and that is true to a point but it's also like you're living for something other than yourself you have more responsibility you know a man's income goes up when he gets a wife statistically on average and then goes even you know higher when he has the kids and of course you have to support other people at that point and take that masculine responsibility but there is, um, you know, something to be said for the spiritual energy that you unlock from God when you are saying in your life, okay, I'm going to dedicate to this person and I'm going to be the rock that they, you know, attach to and are supported by. And in doing so, in making that promise, you know, through marriage, through uh, commitment and, and having a child together is the real marriage other than, you know, this, the ceremony that you have in front of government or whatever. Um that unlocks a certain level of like, okay, this guy's serious and he's going to be, you know, giving more of it as energy to other organisms and helping other people. So I will in turn afford him more energy. And I've heard that from many different people. That's very interesting. 
I've actually yeah. never heard that take. That's super cool. Yeah, ben do you have Greenfield more thoughts on that? I'd love, I'd love to hear your expansion on that point. Yeah, so Ben Greenfield uh, was the main guy that I've kind of heard this from, uh, and I have friends that have hung out with him a bunch over the last couple of years, and he – you know, he, he gets asked a lot. He's obviously doing all the biohacking stuff, um, but it, he seems to be, from what I've heard, uh, I haven't met him personally, but he's like aging in reverse almost. And people are like, oh, you know, what's your secret? Like all these things. And he just says, you know, honestly, like I think it's my family and his his family unit is so strong because he's set out um, the framework of which to spend a lot of time with his kids, his wife, uh, in a meaningful way to grow together, to love them in the spiritual sense that you're acting in the best case of, for their spiritual development and really dedicating to that. And he's religious as well, Christian. Um, and that wellspring of internal energy, that love that you're giving them, which is then being reflected back to you, love is the ultimate way to promote your health internally, is living in, in a state of uh, existence where that's the highest vibrational energy. And the more that you're existing in that state, the better health you're going to be. You know, this is why community uh, is, you know, on the top of the list, literally the top of the list for health in general. And if you're lonely, if you don't have friends, that is the biggest risk factor for early death. What does that say? So it's like this positive feedback loop where you're giving love to someone, uh, you've dedicated yourself, you access this higher level of energy um for your offspring and for also the you know the woman that's going to be relying on you and supporting you as well um but i i think that's a really interesting you know idea in general and to think about like if you want to think about it selfishly it's like yeah you're going to be able to have more of a capacity uh to win to do whatever you want to do at work uh if you have that love at home that very very close community at home and um yeah, definitely something to consider because on the other hand, uh, this friend that knows Ben, he also has also like kind of been around these more successful biohacking uh, entrepreneur guys who are like late 30s, 40s, and they look great and they're still, you know, dating the young girls that kind of go around that space, but they don't have that resonant inner energy you know, spirit force, which is going to make you uh, the best version of yourself because they haven't, you know, they're still doing the Burning Man whole thing, you know, uh, psychedelics and, you know, casual sex, shall we say. Um, and that's just not very fulfilling. And they may be healthy in a way, but they're not like truly spiritually uh, healthy on the inside. It's more so this like physical health, which is good, but it's not the whole thing. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Burning Man. Burning Man feels like, I don't know, it feels like a place that, and I've never been. Um, I was planning yeah. to go this year, and I'm sure there's some parts of it that are beautiful, yeah. but it does strike me as, you know, uh, mainly a place that, well, not mainly, but that a lot of, like, pseudo-spiritual <laughs> like growth yeah. happens where it's like i did acid and then i had sex with a stranger and we're all yeah. one yeah like it's like yeah. okay yeah. But you don't uh... <laughs> yeah man i've changed yeah yeah i don't know like i said I, i'm sure with a lot of these things there's you know like you said as well there's there's good things to happen from it but there is definitely a, the darker side where that get fucked up on drugs and have casual sex in the desert is seen as spiritual when actually it's like, well, what am I actually doing? It's this super voyeuristic um, cope in a way. <laughs> just like, just like getting fucked up and going to the clubs and drinking is like a cope in a way and like forgetting the shitness of your current life uh, and having to go back to the office on Monday. It's like you get drunk and, you know, go out to the clubs on the weekend. It's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna have shrooms and acid and go to Burning Man this week, and then I don't. Know. And I'm sure there are great, you know, revelations that people have, and I'm not shitting on it really because I haven't been, so I don't know. 
but it does seem to be you know this more general theme of um yeah psychedelics in general people not treating with what they should uh the respect that they should and uh yeah the sex being used in that sense as well yeah yeah that's a funny point um okay well just to wrap this point up i think the last part that we can kind of explore is just is i mean actually you did mention you know there are some kings and i think it is even in in christianity and other religions um not necessarily improper to have multiple wives but specifically in islam in the quran it does say um you know if you can support multiple wives then you are allowed multiple wives what are your thoughts Mm. on um I, I just, I guess um, you seem like you've read, you know, quite a bit, like thoughts just on the different religions and how they, they tackle uh, relationships, polygamy, and monogamy. Well, there's one argument um, to say that the metric of one wife per one man has given rise to the stability that created Western nations. Mm. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that in raw nature, the alpha lion has several female lions that he will impregnate. And the kind of bottom of the barrel lions, they don't get anything. They just kind of chill and and maybe wait to the day that they're strong enough to, to overtake the alpha or whatever. Uh, and so there's this like 80-20 principle where most of the available mates go to the strongest gorilla lion elephant i'm sure it's, that's just the way that nature is and that is true for humans on some level but when you incorporate something like marriage where in the government um from the government and religion the religious point of view the church's point of view it's like okay this is your wife and this is your husband and you will be a family unit together that enables more people to have a mate and have a family and be uh, sexually, socially uh, satisfied in that way, relationship satisfied. Otherwise, what happens is, and this is what we're seeing now, is a lot of underachieving men who have never even kissed a girl uh, have nothing else to do except stew in their own uh, mental ruminations about you know how shit the world is and will usually lead to crime, violence, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know whether that happens with or without the social institutions of marriage, um, but it is definitely one perspective that, you know, Western nations work best when there is this structure where, okay, you have one woman and you guys make family together. And like I said before, that does seem to lead to the most stable uh, societies where the excess creative energy which is sexual se- sexual energy is creative energy that excess which would have gone to kind of fruitless endeavors of pursuing multiple women is now used instead to create art to create a business or whatever it is and that you know contributes to society and contributes to the progression and success of your economy and your community way more than trying to bust a nut with the next girl you know so i think that that's the model which we should strive to um as far as you know multiple wives in other religions i wouldn't say that i'm you know educated enough to really understand that i haven't you know practiced it and haven't grown up in a situation where i can view that in action but i would say that there are usually probably like the favorite one the people that aren't as happy um no one is really like it's impossible to have a an equal relationship with each one so there's always going to be someone that doesn't get what they want out of it which then causes resentment uh and then that is just like a pretty bad energetic relationship to or environment energetic environment to raise kids in or to exist in on a uh, a general basis so that's what i'd say about that obviously there probably is some happy Mm. ones out there and if that's what you want then go for it Uh, i'm not one to 
you know, say other way. But as far as most people in most situations, uh, it's probably more of a headache than than benefit. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've explored it certainly. I mean, I, I last night I watched the Zeitgeist. We were talking about this a little bit, but you know, I I've I just recently became cognizant of the fact that we've just been fear mongered by the media and by just everything in the US against Islam and against uh the, you know the entire culture, the entire Muslim culture. And yeah. I started to question why, and I started to just ask myself funky questions like, you know, why do they not want us? Why do they want us to like hate Muslims, basically? And um, yeah, I visited Morocco in 2018, and I was like, that was one of the most beautiful experiences that I've ever had. Like, yeah. <laughs> the country is beautiful. The people yeah. were beautiful, um, like beautiful sold. Um and yeah and then more recently i just started kind of thinking about it and uh i watched a little documentary called like the men with many wives and it's interesting it's like these men um i think they live in it's actually based in the uk and it's there's a lot of uh um, muslims in the uk and this documentary just shows what it's like for you know your average man who has multiple families basically and how yeah. kind of all the wives hang out together and it's sort of this big kind of happy family. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's fascinating. I mean, um, I think like, and I've spoken to some of my friends who are, um, who are Muslim. And I think part of the, the, the theory of the benefits of Islam is like, if you have, let's say three girlfriends or three wives, and you as the man make enough money to support and provide for the entire family. Um, I guess like one of the, one of the effects of that is, you know, I'm sure every man can relate. Like there's just certain things that like, obviously you want to spend time with your girl, but there's certain things that you just don't want to do as a man, like maybe go shopping or watch that movie that you don't really want to watch, you know, these things. And, <laughs> um, and, and I guess when she has three, when there's three, you know, three girls, they can kind of do those things that you as the man just have zero interest in doing, you know, and it kind of gives you your own space. It also yeah. gives, um, for example, the ability to raise the kids uh, with m more help, you know, and mm -hmm. being able to like, um, for example, like you and one, like you want to take one of your wives out for for dinner or something. The other two can stay and watch all the kids that you have, you know, um, or you want to take one on vacation and you kind of trade off. But at the same time, if you do watch the documentary, it's called, um, it's called the men with many wives. It's, it's quite interesting. It, it does. There definitely are exactly as you predicted. There's some like d d issues with de uh, jealousy and you have to like be very careful about not giving too much attention to this one or that one. And yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it's definitely, um, it's interesting, you know. Well, let's let's transition there because last night I watched the Zeitgeist. I can't believe it's on YouTube. It doesn't seem like it's something that would fly. Yeah, it's just interesting, there. right? Like, why do they allow it? Yeah, why do the powers that be allow it to be there? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I I don't think I wrote any. I didn't write any particular questions because I just watched it last night. But I mean, for for people don't know what it is it's basically this uh exploration of what happened with 9-11 and it explores what is the federal reserve and fractional reserve banking and um how war is basically a gigantic business what are your thoughts on government conspiracies or i guess like the government behind the government conspiracies you know the federal reserve um and the control that's happening from the man behind the curtain. Uh, I, I guess just starting in general, and then we can kind of go more into individual yeah. Uh, spaces. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is a, you know, a very long conversation, which is kind of rabbit hole. I've, I've added to my uh, knowledge over the years and it all begins when you realize that the media 
I guess, is not actually telling you the whole truth. As a kid, you think that, oh, I'm just, um, you know, the news is telling us what's happened today. And and that guy's wearing then, a suit, so we should trust him. Yeah, yeah. You know, he looks official. He's speaking in this, you know, serious way. And, um, you know, he's just a good guy and wants to inform us. And then you realize that the all of the news companies are owned by the same publishing companies and they give out the general headlines that they want all of the different news companies to focus on and then who owns these publishing companies back in the day it was you know families like the rockefellers they're still you know one of the biggest owners of these media companies and they are obviously going to want to promote a narrative that um helps them helps their various financial interests and on one side you can think of that as the reason for all of this is like okay companies exist and uh they obviously want to maximize their own personal profits so they're going to try and promote the narrative and make the key decisions that are going to make people make them more money and that's the very that's a reduction of it um but what you what ends up happening is you get a very what's the word this perspective this slice which ignores a whole bunch of other stuff and eventually is going to lead to you know your health your sovereignty and um all the rest of it being sacrificed for their profit and that's what you got to realize now with zeitgeist the whole thing it goes into the federal reserve system how that is controlled by you know a small group of international bankers uh, and they will create literally global uh, events, global negative events to enrich themselves. They were behind starting World War II, World War I. Um, the same people will sell weapons to both sides uh, in order to profit. And they don't care that they you know, will kill thousands, millions of people to do so. They just make money. Uh, so um they they create these false flag events such as the attack on pearl harbor was set up um gulf of tonkin incident all of these things which then get used and they'll create these events that will scare people that'll make people feel enraged feel like they need to defend uh their country and so on and so forth and that is used as the pretext to then go to war which then enables them to make shitload of money off selling the arms, selling the weapons, still happening today. The Iraq war, oh yeah, the invasion of, um, they've got nuclear bombs. Never did, but if they can use the media to say that, to justify their invasion, then they get you know billions and billions of dollars. Usually- So let's, let's connect the dots for people to really understand because it took me a moment to understand right. this. Um, which is another, I think, really good part that that movie pointed out is, you know, the the powers that be through media, through TikTok, through, you know, different psychological operations. They don't want us to think and connect dots. So so can you just point out, for example, how um, how how causing something like Pearl Harbor uh, 9-11 how does that end up to someone making a shit ton of money? Right. So let's say any anything that you can use to justify a war, um, Pearl Harbor being the main pretext uh, for that war, uh, if they can say this is the first event that uh, Japan has invaded Americans on American soil and then – most people, well, I, I think it ends up being like still a very small fraction of people, but more people than in general would think, okay, now we have to defend ourselves. Let's go overseas and attack Japan. Um, let's get the US involved with these things. Once the US is involved, then you mobilize the government coffers, the government money to eventually you have to you know, pay for weapons, pay for artillery, pay for ammunition. And where does that come from? Um, well, you have to borrow the funds from these international banks. You say, hey, we need to go to war. Um, can we have X millions of dollars and we'll pay you back this amount, which we will end up taxing from uh, you know, the people in our countries uh, and so on and so forth. And the international bankers will do that to both sides. Um, 
So that's how they make their money. There's interest. They, you know, the other mechanism of control that the financial system implements on people is this idea of debt, uh, of charging interest. And basically that's money upon money upon money, which doesn't exist, never existed. It's just numbers on a hard drive somewhere. And that's pretty much our entire financial system right now is just numbers on a hard drive. Um, if you really think about it. So debt is just creating this amount of money. It's like, I'll give you this money and then you need to get this, give me more money back for what, you know? Um, some people think that, oh, it's just the cost of paying a loan. But what it is, is, is why they implement student debt as the only kind of debt that is non-dischargeable. You can't get rid of it. Every other debt, you can file bankruptcy and get rid of it. But if they can convince young Americans, young people all over the world to go into debt, to fund these student loans, which have ridiculous interest, which you can never get rid of, you basically have this drain on your financials your entire life, which is what most people are realizing. And so you're a slave. You're a slave. You're working to pay this back to the colleges, which have billions of dollars worth of endowment funds. And it's a system of control. And they're not creating any, you know, goods or services which is like adding value to the world to the economy it's just this fake debt cycle uh and that didn't used to exist you know jesus cast the money lenders from the temple because it was seen as a inherently anti-religious horrible thing to do to people and i believe in islam they have similar rules against money lending um because it's not it's just this very like parasitic way to um control people and so that is probably the main mechanism that a lot of people um are unfortunately bought into you know ourselves included on on some level by just how we are you know part of this society and that is part of the benefit of making your own money in a way that you don't have to do what any anyone else tells you whereas as we've seen in previous times if if the job that you have that you need to keep paying your debts is requiring requiring you to get this medical technology, this experimental injection, then you have no choice really. But if you own your own business and they say you have to get this and you'd be like, no, I don't. <laughs> I am still going to make money without it. Then they don't have that level of control over you. What they want to do, what the, the grand overarching vision for, uh, let's say this global people that are organizing behind the scenes is to get everyone um, microchipped in a way and linked to this electronic debt global dollar system and universal currency. And so if that, like you see this with how often do people use cash these days? It's this slow grind of things away from physical reality and into, oh, just tap. It's just electronic. It's beep, beep, beep. And then you... you <coughs> Nothing can happen without the government's involvement. And they can also shut you off. This is why electric cars are so bad as well. Because they require, <coughs> excuse me, they require an internet connection to turn on the car in, in some cases. Or because there is an internet connection that is, yeah, it's downloading and software updates, then there exists the capacity for you to be shut off, to be for your car to be turned off. Beep, boop, boop, sorry, not turning on today because the government has uh, pretty much said that you're an enemy of the state and now you you know you believe in traditional men and women and so you're a fucking Nazi and now you're you can't drive to wherever you want to go anymore. That that's why they want to phase out normal cars, is because the car is a symbol of freedom and you can go wherever you want with it. All it requires is petrol and um, you know, a, a, a fucking battery and then you're good to go but electric cars don't like that they're relying on the power grid um there's it's just the same you can kind of see this in everything in all of this slow encroachment on freedom where everything is being moved to electronic tracking um you have to buy into this system in order to participate in society and if you don't you're a piece of shit and um, what it does is just means that <clears throat> we're going to have less uh, freedom and these people that just want to more 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 control more 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 money uh, will that's what they want to do with everything
and this has been happening for you know a hundred years. So we're we're at the tail end of it, and it's kind of coming to a cusp now. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of in turbulence. This is kind of like you have to see the benefit in it. Is that more people waking up to where like our boomer parents, even though stuff was going on then, like false flags. Now we know it's happening because we can share information online and in real time. You guys can listen to this podcast and investigate these things. Where you know specifically 9/11, um, you had two planes fly into two buildings and three buildings completely collapsed, like they do in controlled demolition. Why did the third building collapse? Oh, there was a fire on two levels and then it just collapsed. No, it doesn't happen. Even um, buildings that you know are entirely ablaze, they don't just collapse like as if someone had planned it. So then a September 11 attacks were either orchestrated or allowed to happen uh, by the government in order to generate mass fear, justify the war on terror, get you to take your shoes off of the, the airports uh, and then provide a pretext. It's this whole problem reaction solution the problem is being 9 11 reaction is you know it's a we need to have a war we need to have a war we need to have less rights in order to capture the terrorists in our own land um your civil liberties decreased your privacy privacy decreased uh and then there's obviously economic gain people like larry silverstein i shared a video uh, on twitter that i saw where I think it was like three months before the 9-11 attacks, he was sold the World Trade Centers um, for $14 million. And then he took out the most exorbitant terrorist insurance policies he could find. Three months before 9-11, he took out these policies on the World Trade Center. And then he made something like $1.4 billion to collect that. So either that's the greatest coincidence of all time uh, or something was kind of something was going on, and he was just by chance not in New York on that day when he usually does work there in the financial services areas. So there's a lot of uh, examples like that of government uh, government officials making trades before on airlines before that happened, and just little things like that where it's like if it stinks that much, then there's obviously something going on, and you can look back at pretty much most of these events where another one is like the, the whole school shooting uh, system. There's like the, um, what was the other one? The Las Vegas shooting as well. Just so many aspects to these events, which don't logically make sense. Like could only have happened where with someone else helping him, abiding him. And the narrative from the media again is always, Oh, legal citizens need less guns. That's always w what it comes down to is you need less capacity to defend yourself. And why would they need that? Why would they want that? Because America uniquely has, thank God, you know, this, this massive culture of being armed in the citizen. And that was one of the great things that the founding fathers did um, to the point where you cannot lock down America like you can Australia or these other countries where Australia has already fallen for, you know, Port Arthur, uh, massacre where everyone gave up their guns instantly like i don't know whether that was a real thing or not i'm not saying either way but the result of that was okay all the australian citizens need to give up their guns now because guns are bad it's like no that's not i don't have to i shouldn't have to give up my rights because someone else did something bad that doesn't make sense at all and that now there's no guns in australia really unless you're a farmer and need it for work so America doesn't have that, which make, means it's very hard for people to control the same way that European countries are controlled. And, you know, this whole narrative of school shootings and other things, it's like the end result is they want to take your guns because when they try to enforce this global control system, uh, they need a monopoly on um, force in order to scare you, in order to do what they want. And if they don't have that monopoly on force because the populace is armed, they can't do that. You always see that with communist dictators. The first thing that they do when they get into power is a, a gun buyback or a gun purchase or you know, surrender your guns kind of movement. And then he starts to get really fucking bad and, and you know, make these decisions with rounding people up in camps. Um, 
so yeah that's like the zoomed out perspective of how i see everything going in this way and it's 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 really should be motivation more so than it is you know to get worried about it and scared about it motivation to be as dangerous as possible be as financially um strong as possible independent as possible and to make communities and to make sure that you're aware of what's going on so that you know when shit really does hit the fan you're not just stuck there unknowing like everyone else will be so i'm making a thing because i'm actually trying to help everyone understand this and honestly help myself understand it um i love figma they just got sold for apparently like 20 billion dollars um never heard of them before that yeah crazy i've been using them for a while but okay so we have um we have an event take 9 11 we can talk about the pandemic later (laughs) after that event someone (laughs) says this is an act of war which leads to less rights uh to capture terrorists in their own land Mm -hmm. and then we need to build and buy weapons for war but we don't have money so in order to fund that, you need to get a loan from an international <laughs> bank for nine bajillion dollars. Yeah. And then this is a part I need help understanding. Mm-hmm. To pay back the loan, we tax our own people in our country with interest. So where is the profit made and who are the people that are profiting? The international bank. They get this bank. paid back the money with interest. Yeah. Ah, this bank. Got it. Yeah. So the countries will pay back money to the international banks um with interest okay so and they also get control right like it's not just the money it's the you owe us nine billion dollars you have to put through this bill which will mean our pharmaceutical companies will be much more profitable xyz can ask for favors yeah so the bankers are the bad guys because they so they allegedly plan these events. Mm-hmm. And then that leads to some kind of constriction of rights. You can't leave your house. You have to get this in your arm. X, yeah. Y, Z. Cash, okay, we need to... No cash. We need to, can't travel. Yeah, need, whatever. Yeah. And then it's, we need... It's really, we need X, right? Yeah. Uh, but so don't this is an important money. one, is the most recent pandemic is what a war on an invisible enemy yeah it's a war on something that you can't see you can't test for allegedly like sometimes you know oh yeah you could have it without even symptoms bs um and the war is the medical things that you can take to help protect from it it's the masks it's the gloves it's the testing it's all of this. That's the war on this virus, which will lead to billions and billions of dollars of benefit, plus more control over p- the unsuspecting citizen. So, but in this case, it's not, we need a loan from a bank, right? Or is it? In this case, it's we, it's not, this isn't the, it's, is it not the bankers? It's the pharmaceutical. Or, I mean, where's, like, is there a loan well, yeah, involved the, the, in this? Um, I mean, I'm sure there probably is, but not not to the same capacity that a war would be, I guess. Right. But maybe there is, you know, I think at this point there was enough money to just spend government funds on. It's like a, a re-transfer, direct transfer of money away from the people, taxation being the theft of money from the people to line the... Um, pockets of the pharmaceutical companies and then the government will give the pharmaceutical companies uh, what's the word immunity from anything bad that happens which is you know fucked Mm. (laughs) i'm curious what the chat is thinking of all this they've been kind of quiet i feel like are we blowing your minds you already know this stuff um yeah it's funny i I brought this up the other day i've just been saying a few of these things kind of just at the dinner table uh last week i was visiting my parents um and i was like yeah like because the queen the queen was like an event right i mean and i was like and i don't know if this is 
a thing, but I heard some rumor like, oh, like the queen supported like pedophiles and the whole like adrenochrome stuff and like child trafficking and Epstein and all that. And I was like, yeah, the queen was a pedophile. And my parents like dropped their <laughs> fork. And they're like, what? They're like, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, yeah, like <laughs> she's like drinking baby blood to like get better adrenaline. Like you didn't know that. And they're like, you sound yeah. insane. And then um, I was like, no, like Alex Jones went to the Bohemian Grove and like filmed it. It's all on camera and you can see it. And then I like was showing them like, here they are. They're worshiping an owl god in the forest and they're all doing stuff and mm. burning an effigy. And um, my parents are like, Alex Jones is he's a lunatic. He's um, yep. like he said Sandy Hook was like not real yep. or something. Yep. Um, think of the families. He tormented those families um and probably he did i mean the the kids didn't not like the kids existed right i mean obviously allegedly uh, allegedly <laughs> i mean i'm pretty sure they did i mean i don't want to say i don't want to speak on that but regardless of if they did it accomplished an agenda did it not right and and even if you know let's say that they the media in this time is telling the truth and <laughs> that Alex Jones is a bad guy for doing this one this this thing wrong. Everything else that he's talking about is real, has happened. You go see him um broadcasting after 9/11 when it happened. Uh you can like he he lays it all out there and he's been banging on about this stuff for 20 years longer, I'm sure. And all of the other stuff he's said has come and passed. So it's like Okay, are we all that the the Sandy Hook thing was to discredit his ninety nine percent record of talking about the things that happened? So it's kind of irrelevant at that point. But it's it's what it's what they were using to discredit him, and because it's mm. such an emotionally charged thing, um, yeah, yeah, it's like, like someone commented, yeah, the frogs being gay thing. What the media likes to do is. They will take something out of context, obviously, or stupidize it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a word, but they'll say, <laughs> oh, yeah, Alex Jones thinks the frogs are turning gay. Yeah. But what, yeah. It, actually, what it actually is, is atrazine being um, leaked by chemical factories and you know, factory farming and stuff into waterways. And then the amphibians, the, the frogs that existed in those waterways, because of the atrazines, a massive endocrine disruptor, they're turning female when they're male. And so it's completely fucking up their hormones, uh, their genes, their sexual expression. And so they're not turning gay as such, but the chemical stuff in the water is having a massive effect on their sexual dimorphism. And guess what? That's happening to people as well. What is that in our water supply and are the chemicals in our food and all the chemicals in the other stuff in the air and all the rest of it, uh, birth control, pills, uh, medication, again, from the pharmaceutical companies, antidepressants, plastic and everything. All of that is impacting our, um, you know, our hormones, our sexual dimorphism and our relationships at the end of the day, everything comes back to people wanting to make money, this global elite or whatever. But then there's also the issue of they want to have less people, depopulation. They're a eugenics cult, which means they want to reduce the amount of low-born scum, basically, because that's how they view people like this. You know, a lot of people will mention to me like, oh, why do they want to kill off the people that will do what they say you know it can't possibly this jab can't be dangerous it's like well if their goal is to have less people and you will do what they say they don't care that they are killing off the people that listen to them they're just their goal is to kill off more people so they don't believe that we have a right to exist as these powerless you know uh, genetically inferior people in the world should not have to support as many of us as there are because in strength, in, in numbers lies our strength, you know, with all of this stuff that is pushed onto us by the media. There are so many actual people that if everyone just said, nope, not doing that, not complying, 
not listening to the news, they literally can't do anything. They, their security forces, whatever they have to control you, the, even the government itself in any country, all the people have to do is rise up as one and say no. And when that critical mass of people hits no, they literally can't do anything and they have to back down from whatever they're trying. The issue being is that their hold on fear and the way that they use it on people is that people are scared of sticking up for something. They're scared of sticking their neck out. Um, there's so many reasons why people don't like to, you know, resist in a way. But if everyone resisted at the same time, then there's nothing that they can do. They can't throw everyone in the jail. They can't, um, you know, lock everyone up at once. But because the first couple people usually get you know, shut down, depersoned from the internet uh, and all the rest of it, it scares everyone else from speaking up. And that's the only way uh, that they kind of have their power is through use of fear. And, you know, on some macro level, one could argue that as soon as that tipping point of the human consciousness starts to act out of love instead of fear across all things, uh, then you know, they will cease to have a, any kind of chokehold of power over us. The issue being now is with things like AI and robotics that, and technology where if you are locked into this global system of where you can't even buy your food without, um, you know, a, a chip in your hand, that is a lot harder to resist than it has been previously. And obviously you can still go hunting and, you know, skills like that and growing your own food. Um, they will a hundred percent come for that soon as well uh, by saying that you can't do it. You know, it's illegal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of which is, you know, this is why they want to control the food supply in Europe. It's the energy crisis as well uh, in Europe is like, if people aren't, warm in their homes and they're not going to be able to you know protest and things uh this manufactured crisis of ukraine of russia and not being able to deliver oil um you can't you know do anything without oil and if oil prices are sky high then the food trucks can't move around and if you don't have food then you don't have any law and then the government steps in this with this solution saying hey we've got food we've got oil but we have to completely reset it this global reset that they want we have to reset it on this digital currency and to get the digital currency you have to you know sign up no privacy probably chip and jab uh, in order to do so to show that you're a good citizen and that is the way that you know this will go on uh, and this is the only way that we can fix this situation and they don't care if people die in the process. So let's talk about these, the people that are behind this narrative and are behind this control, who want the control, who want the power. I think it obviously goes back to the Rockefeller, um, you know, Federal Reserve group that created all of this. Um, but actually, did you hear they, they have a picture of like, He's like enemy number one in like the based world. Did you hear about this? Ooh. There's a picture of him. Um, here, I'll pull it up. Screen share. Oh, yeah, here. So that's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard about these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, but seriously. <laughs> no, but like, what is wrong with these people? What? Why are they like this? Uh, are they people? Who is? Who are these sucking? Like these people that are clearly trying to just take humans and like, it's the matrix. It's like these something at the top is trying to suck humans for all of their energy and like destroy them. Yeah, well, I am not going to be able to do justice to the whole. Uh, shebang of it all and uh, anyone that's interested uh, in at least these theories I would recommend reading David Icke's work uh, he is one of the other guys that they have been like oh he's crazy he's the worst guy in the world oh my goodness and he's another person uh, David Icke 
David, and then I C K E is his name. Yeah, he's great. Uh, he, he's I been, got into him at the start of the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. He's been calling everything as it's going to happen. Twenty years ago, he was talking about how they're going to be implementing these biological medical systems and what it means. But in his book, The Truth Shall Set You Free, or And the Truth Shall Set You Free, he exposes what he thinks is the real story behind global events, uh, why they happen. And basically, he, he mentions that, you know, everything that exists in the world is some expression of God and the energy that connects us all. Uh, the good people, the bad people, uh, they are playing out their role. And on some levels, this whole authoritarian pressure that we are feeling and going through is a mechanism for us to discover our inner strength, our spiritual awareness. And without that, if everything was just hunky-dory and chill and you never had any reason to investigate these things and you know check out who actually is powerful behind the scenes, then you're, never, you're not growing in that sense. And some then people would reject it. Exactly. You know, you're, some Which people reject this <laughs> because they don't want to think that you have to go through negative stuff in order to grow. But if you want strength, you're going to have to go through hardships. And that's how you have to view all of this stuff. And I think that these people are a, are a manifestation of the darkness that is inside humans. Um, David Icke goes into it and says that they are, you know, Satanists on some level trying to appease an internet, interdimensional entity that feeds off the negative energy of humans. And they are a poly reptilian interdimensional race that um, will b basically, you know, create wars between humans in order to fill, feed off that negative energy. And that negative energy is, you know, this matrix entity, uh, which is then, you know, kind of what we have to break out of in order to ascend to this perfect life, peace on earth scenario, which is possible if we all basically say enough's enough and stop reacting through fear. And that's, that's mm. a summary of, of what he speaks about it. I don't know. Of course, this is all. No, it's a great answer. Conjecture. Answer. It's all um, who knows, but it is interesting to think about it. And I think that as far as the practical things that we do day to day, they are going to be good things to do regardless of what is happening. You know, even if this stuff isn't true, if you get financially independent, you become dangerous, you organize with people and you become aware of people that are making financial decisions behind the scenes, you become aware of who your government is actually trying to protect. These are all good things. These all make you a more responsible citizen in your community. And they're all going to mean that you're a more conscious, aware and well-developed person, regardless of who actually is uh, what is going on. Mm. Yeah, I like the the description or the 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 theory about the manifestation of the powers that be and what they are and kind of what their purpose is. It makes yeah. a lot of sense, you know, to me at least um, spiritually and thinking of things like levels of energy, um, you know, the consciousness scale and how. In order to experience higher levels of energy, you have to go through hardship. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I mean, on the uh, on the David Ike stuff, another name that just comes to mind is Dolores Cannon, who I'm sure you've mm, uh, yep. explored a little bit. What What are your thoughts on on her and the give a, a brief background on that for our viewers now? Well, yeah, she is a I guess a spiritual author guide. Uh, I've only read one of her books, um, but yeah, very prolific author and her, her system of belief, I guess, is, is that we are spiritual entities that have come from other planets or other areas, other spirit realms to this earth, to this realm, this physical realm in order to experience this particular life in order to spiritually develop so that we can go through this life and at the end of it, we can go, wow, you know, because contextually 
earth is seen as this spiritual training ground because it is so tough to exist here compared to the spirit realm um, or these other various dimensions or whatever. So on, a, on some levels, I can see that that makes sense because our awareness, our spirit and our soul, you know, it's not just the body. And there is many different phenomena that make sense when you conceptualize our existence as something that isn't just limited to this physical plane. And, you know, I have memories of things that I haven't gone through in, in this life, um, past life memories. She's a big proponent of that. The idea that we are basically reincarnating over and over again in different lives and different ways of life on earth in order to learn something and that we came into no matter how bad you think your life is and whatever situation is, is happening. Um, you decided you may not have memory of this, but your spirit decided to experience that in this situation for some reason in order to go stronger uh, and so on. And that's not, you know, the only thing that she talks about, but she also mentions how, people that are aware people that are conscious in this realm like i would say most people at least investigating these topics and thoughts and listening to this podcast are is that you are you have a responsibility in some way you're a part of this wave of volunteers she calls them that have come to this realm volunteers to come to earth and say i'm going to help wake up more humans and more or more spirits that are that are in human bodies by choosing love by hey you're you're living out of fear you're you're limiting yourself and your capacity for existence because you're choosing to believe things that aren't true you're allowing to be, yourself to be ruled over instead of you know going for what you want and all these things where it, it, the real goal of existence in my opinion is to lessen human suffering and that can mean in your direct interactions with other people, it can mean in the information that you give out to them, it can mean entertaining them, it can mean a whole bunch of things, but primarily using your God-given innate qualities, traits, gifts, circumstances, lessons, strengths to communicate information or deliver it in a way that will mean other people don't have to make the same spiritual, physical, mental relationship mistakes that you have or help them on their way in some capacity and if we can all do that and not aim to um control other people or whatever it is then you know we'd have a great fucking life here <laughs> someone just um wrote in the chat will you guys just give some girl advice and i said yes we'll do that next and then he said for real i need a wife not spirit training <laughs> and I, said, I said you need spirit training to find yes. a wife my friend yeah you, you can't so, get that without the spirit training because do you want a wife that's attracted say you haven't developed the spirit do you want a wife that is going to be attracted to a guy without a spirit no <laughs> so it's like you can't put the cart before the horse in a way and this is why the whole idea of like monk mode is a thing it's like okay you're not having much success with girls right now why don't you go away and work on yourself develop your body for six months you read so you're more um mentally prepared and experienced you just live life you do things and then you come back and that level of girls that you have quote access to or the girls that will be interested in you are going to be better and you can extrapolate that you don't have to go completely monk mode and not talk to any girls to do that but it can be helpful when you're first starting out so i think the whole principle of um you know, I need the wife for the spirit training. It's not impossible, but the quality of the wife that you're going to get is, is much lower. So knowing that, knowing that, you know, you as a man are, and the woman that you attract is parallel to the quality of man that you become, um, you know, the level of success you have, the body that you develop, the spirit that you develop, the intellect that you develop, the relationships that you build. How does a man decide when, is the time to, I guess you could say, cash his chips in and be open to a relationship that he's looking to commit to for, you know, a long-term period. Hmm. Well, it's impossible to say that there's going to be a time, right? It's like, yeah. if you, I think 
you know you're eventually going to do it with someone. You're eventually going to have this long-term, hopefully for life relationship where you build a family together. Wouldn't you ideally want more time spent with that person, more depth of relationship being able to be found, more memories shared together, and more shared history being created? So effectively saying, you know, the sooner the better. But that has to be predicated on, you know, having knowing them well enough to know that they're shared visions shared values um you know their history you know how they are in relationships again not everyone's going to be perfect but you definitely don't want to just jump in because okay all right let's have a family a life together straight away because i want to be with you forever that's not going to work either so i would say it's you got to really dive into what beliefs you have about relationships as well while improving yourself like this is the issue with red pill stuff is they can help you attract women for sure but they're not going to help you keep women long term uh when the comfort side of things is needed and they're not going to attract the type of women that you're really going to want to wife up because like you know there are some things that work but there are just some things that is like an actually mature well-developed girl who had a great father figure is going to look at you and be like what are you doing dude what are you peacocking right now like <laughs> it's it's just not going to happen yeah i think i mean i don't i don't have the exact answer to it but i think it's actually more detached from a man's level of success and income than he than is purported by um, the red pill space. I think, yeah. I mean, the my best girlfriend... is when you find a girl that likes you and sees the potential in you, and then you actualize the potential with her. Exactly. Because if you only, like, that's not to say that you can't meet girls after the fact, but there's always the not worry, but like, does she only love the success I have and not me? Right. Right. I think it, it actually has much more to do with your character as a man and what she sees in you and your potential um, than it does actually have to do with what you physically carry and, you know, your assets that you have. Because, you know, at the end of the day, and there's countless examples of this, you know, as a man, you, you can lose it all pretty quickly. Something can happen, a disaster in your business, you can get sued, um, and you can lose your assets. You can lose all those things. Will you have a girl that sticks by you because she knows you can build it back together? Um, and that's that's one of the things that I really admire about my girlfriend is she'll say it. She says it to me, um, not all the time, but she's said it multiple times. Like, you know, if you, like, if you went broke, I'd still stay with you and we'd rebuild. She's like, we would do it again. Yeah. Um and and the thing is, and I, I, I kind of like laugh at it because I'm I'm pretty red pilled myself. I'm like, yeah, but would you though? Like, <laughs> would you really? Um yeah. like so but I, I don't know. I think um I, I think finding a girl that really truly would stay with a man after he's lost everything is is quite rare. And I think that true loyalty of that measure um is pretty difficult to find. Um I like to think that I've, I have some, some tips and some hacks that you can find to identify. And I also have a, a, a bit of a thought pattern that I didn't get to express earlier that um, is just on the, the downdraft effects of, of this hookup culture thing that's being purported by like the 1% man space, you know, have, you know, hook up with as many girls as you can and as you want and 1% men get to do whatever they want. So I'll speak on that in a second. But I think one of the hacks is, um, I mean, my girlfriend has an insanely tight knit family. Her dad has yeah. eight siblings or he's one of eight. I always kind of forget. Um, yeah. and they all, the, him, her father and his seven siblings live within 10 minutes of each other. And growing up, incredible. my girlfriend had 30 cousins <laughs> and they would do, uh, they would do Friday night Shabbat dinner every week. And so the vast majority of her, you know, people that she's closest with today, she's known since birth. So, yeah. you know, to know, to see that, to see a girl that has strong ties to her family, I think is a really good indicator. That's not to say that, you know, if 
a girl comes from a broken household, like can't be loyal. I think that there's the argument that, you know, because she never got to see a loyal family, she that's all she wants for herself. But I, I do think that's a, a good um, indicator. I think the danger of um, hookup culture that I think 1% men or men seeking to be, you know, in the upper echelon of, of higher performance. I think the responsibility that, that men have is not to corrupt the, um, not to corrupt women, you know? And I, and I think, uh, I was actually, this is something that Justin pointed out to me, Justin Liao, um, who is John Galt, Justin Liao, um, who pointed out, you know, when you have a girl that's loyal to you and you start kind of having visions or fantasies or ideas of like, Oh, well I could hook up with this girl and that girl you are, if you choose to do that, the downdraft effects of you making that single decision are polluting the, the few good girls that yeah. are out there. Cause yeah. ultimately, I mean, men take the lead, right. And we, our decisions will shape, you know, the, the, the women will follow the man's lead. And if men are, you know, as you said earlier, leading this hookup culture kind of mentality, then it's just going to happen more and more and more. And women are going to do the reciprocal. Um, what are yeah, your thoughts? It's, it's both, right? Because women will do what men allow in a society, right? And that is at a macro level, if, if, no guys wanted to sleep around or, or they didn't. And it, I mean, it's both. You can't really say it's one or the other, but in your own way, you have to stop contributing because, you know, there are elements of it that are fun and validating to, for, uh, for other people. But if you stay in that level of awareness and vibration, then, you know, can you speak out about it? No. And can you, are you going to find something wonderful? No. Um, and it's the whole idea of karma as well. Anything that you do to other people will impact not only them, but anyone they come into contact with and then their children and so on and so forth, where every interaction you have with someone, really every thought and every action you have has a ripple on effect through the sands of time at a macro level. And the karma that you are accruing for yourself is a basically the sum of all of the energetic actions and thoughts and feelings that you have done in your life in past lives. And you are either impacting that positively or negatively by what you do. If you lie to other people, um, then that is going to negatively affect them as well. And they're going to go through a lot of negative feelings because of it. So, you know, it's just about being honest about what you want and not contributing to anyone feeling bad about themselves, <clears throat> really. I'm back. I had to grab my charger. Um, where did you leave off? Sorry. I, I pretty much finished by just saying it's, it's the idea of karma. You got to be truthful. You got to pursue what you want, but do it in a way that's never going to affect other people because or affect them negatively because that is affecting them, their children, everyone they come into contact with and building this karmic debt, either good or bad for you when you go into your future life after this one. And you have that karmic effect from the past lives that you've, that you've done. So aside from beauty and I think another popular trait that most men nowadays know they want from a woman is loyalty. What do you think are the traits that make up a high value women that men can be filtering for? Um, yeah, well, you kind of mentioned this with the relationship with the family, but relationship with their dad, if that is good, it's really, that's a major, major core point is because they'll have a healthy perspective on what um, masculinity is. Uh, they're going to respect themselves. They're not going to feel like they, have to do things for male validation because their dad loved them no matter what. And so there's going to be inbuilt honesty, loyalty, trust, all of that stuff from there. Uh, so that's a big one. Um, I would say someone that loves, you know, taking care of themselves, doesn't drink, 
uh, at least much, you know, the occasional wine, whatever. But like if they're blasting fucking white claws and going out to the club every weekend, but she's pretty, it's like mm, one that's not going to last once she hits 25 and, and the youth kind of starts to fade. Anyone that not even girls, but anyone that drinks regularly on the weekends and then loses their, you know, the youth that is carrying them through in the last five years, they've been eating kebabs and smashing shots on the weekend and not sleeping for years at a time. It's like, yeah, you're not going to come out of that looking too, too fresh. So having a girl that like really takes care of her health, puts time into that, um, goes to the gym on some level, like you can teach a girl to weight lift properly and all of that. Uh, so that's not necessarily a deal breaker, but at least have a girl that's like cares about her health because that health is going to eventually pass on to your children and also going to be a metric for how attractive she is uh, in the in later years of your life, just as you should be very conscious of what you eat and how you live in order to provide an attractive, healthy person for them in the relationship. Uh, all of these things, remember, we have to look at are we ourselves embodying what we want in the other person? Um, otherwise, you know, we're, we're kind of wanting this thing, but we're not putting the time and investment in ourselves to represent that for them. So it's like, it's fake in a way. Um, again, you have to be what you want in the other person. Um, what else would be good? Like someone that's, you know, at least intellectually curious, likes to read is a good one um doesn't watch tv shows things like the kardashians uh, um is is always nice loves outdoors another one is um wants to have kids and there's like a, you would think oh all girls want to have kids one like sometimes they've been brainwashed uh, at a college college girls especially they've been brainwashed to think oh no i want to go to work and earn my own money and i don't want kids until i'm 30 or whatever but if a girl is like if all if her hormones are healthy she'll want a kid and she'll go goo goo gaga when she sees a baby and that is something uh important to look at um if she outwardly expresses she wants children if she doesn't then it's like well yeah, maybe she'll come around, but like, why would you want to waste your time with someone that doesn't want kids? If you want kids, it's just like that relationship isn't going to work. Any of these preferences where you can, it's like, why would you waste time with someone that doesn't want what you want? And it's, that's okay if they want something different. But if you get to a point where you know that about someone, then like, don't waste any more time with each other. Don't waste their time because you want something different and, and so on. Um, being honest, like, being truthful about, you know, how they feel, um, communicating that to you instead of like just being upset, you know, just like generally, okay, this is what you did that, that made me upset. And, you know, can we work through this and, you know, maybe navigate a way around it for the future, uh, communication, obviously a big one. Um, it's pleasant to be around loves, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, mythical yeah, so, creature. So, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, he, he says you're describing a mythical creature. Where do, no, where it's, do you guys it's, find that's not true? This because, woman, because yeah, you know, I have met them. You know, they exist. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like <clears throat> unless you are embodying everything that you want, your the universe isn't going to reward you with someone of that caliber until you are deserving of them. And yes, it's very few people for sure. But if you're choosing your final girl to be with forever, then you want to have high standards, but you also want to be high standard, standarded yourself. And on some level, you may think they're mythical, but if you have that belief, then that's what you're going to get. <laughs> they exist. They are real. You will be put into the social circles that have them when you achieve all of those things yourself. And energetically, you will be attracted and uh, attracted to, and they will be attracted to your level of existence as well. It's funny that the ways that this works, and it sounds kind of silly. It's like you would think, oh, yeah, but surely I, I would run into someone that is like that, you know, and then I would aspire to be good enough for her, or we would grow together. But it's like you almost the the world doesn't give you anything unless you earn it. Mm -hmm. right and unless you believe that it's possible if you go around oh girls like that are mythical creatures 
uh, they don't exist, then you're not going to see them, you know? So, you know, that, that, that's the long and short of it. Where did you meet your girlfriend? Um, IG. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Which I think is, you know, social networks in general. I, this, I mean, you're a big proponent of this as having a good Instagram profile because it's like a, a networking thing. Uh, it's a relationship, you know, dating app in some ways as well. But it's like if you represent who you are honestly on Instagram, then it, the people that are attracted to that Instagram because they like what you have to say and what you're doing and who you are, then that's that's almost like a very focused funnel that's only going to attract the people that you would mesh with and get along with. And this is one of the amazing benefits of having Solbra is like the people that I obviously like like what I like and what I talk about on the Solbra stuff are people that reach out to me. And then it's like, wow, I'm getting along with pretty much everyone I talk to because they're also interested in the same thing. And that's great. And that works for girls as well. So that's, you know, Arlen, you speak about this a lot. It's just like having social networks and, and having them be a good representation of you because that is, that's today's world. Um, and as, as like, oh, you met on, a, on, a, on social networking app, like lame. It's like, well, that's the way the world is right now unless you are in uh, particular social circles in a very you know, high-flying city or something like that. Yeah, there's definitely indicators that you can see that most men might not pick up on of what makes a woman a, a woman that you would want to date in terms of how she's posting on Instagram. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's um, something I've become a lot more cognizant of. And, and the more I've traveled and the more girls I've met and the more I've kind of peeked behind the curtain about uh, kind of how we started this. You know, we were talking about what what leads men astray what uh what is what are men's fantasies that are basically incorrect i think a big one is how much how much boobage and how much skin they <laughs> see on instagram and tiktok and they're just yeah. mindlessly go- googling googling go- ogling over yeah. just like boobs you know and Pixels. these girls that look a certain way on instagram and Um, You know, I've met a lot of these girls and I've hung out with a lot of these girls and, um, you know, there it's, it's the, and I don't want to, again, no, of course, no hate, but we're talking about a girl that you might want to consider to be your girlfriend, like a a girl that's just endlessly accepting invites to Dubai and Warsaw and Miami. And like, she, now she's in Tenerife and like someone's paying for that and, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's that's one thing I look at, you know, how much how much travel is happening on an Instagram page. Um, you can see, is she going to the gym? Is she hanging out with her family? Is she uh, like, what is she working on? What Like, who is the person that she's presenting herself to the world as? Is she posting, you know, certain ass? ass yeah um yeah and and um and yeah just exploring to see you know those these factors um yeah that's interesting i met i met my girlfriend actually and it's funny you know we talked about energy and you know we i think we're both on the same side of you are you give off an energy field and you will attract the women that you basically deserve um and you that you are yourself you know as a man what your reciprocal will be as a woman yeah and that kind of around the time i i mentioned i decided i wanted to have a committed relationship i flew out to los angeles and i went to an event for hubi which is a company i'm a company i'm a part of and chloe who's my girlfriend um was working at the event, she was working with the company that Hubi was collaborating with. It was like an influencer management company. Um, so just, she just happened to be working and, you know, yep. I just went up and said hi and kind of went from there. But yeah, I, I did find it. Uh, this is a question I get quite often from guys is like, where do you find high quality women? I think 
step one and ironically you know the guy was kind of like complaining about the spiritual talk like you have to work on yourself spiritually of course but in every other aspect and then at that time it's it's hard to say exactly where you're going to find her it might be instagram it might be at her work it might be at the gym you, you might be surprised um, but i don't think there's like a, a a if there is a place where you know women who just hang out with their families 24 7 <laughs> are, are just there then I'll, I'll be the first to let everyone know. But, uh, but yeah, I think it, the, the only thing that you can control is yourself. And when you're, you know, the lips of wisdom are closed, except to the ears of understanding, right? Like the, the, you will be presented with what you're ready to get. And it's hard to say exactly when or where that will be. Yep. hundred percent. Nice moment of presence. What do you um, reckon about um, copying a few questions from people in the chat, and then uh, yeah, probably will be time. Sure. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah, ask some questions in the chat, guys. Um, let's see. Have, there was one that have... was uh, earlier. Are you are right. you two against semen retention? And uh, the answer is no. I don't know if you see my profile or whatever. Definitely not against that practice. I think it's super important. I think every guy will benefit from doing it in some level. Uh, obviously, the base level that everyone should do is like never masturbate. Never. Uh, yeah. Don't watch porn. And if you are going to bust, have it be with someone that you care about in a, you know, in, in a loving relationship. Even then, when you have a loving relationship, there are a lot of benefits to consciously choosing when you're going to release rather than just, oh, I'm having sex, I'm going to uh, ejaculate. And it seems uh, weird to some people, but it is very powerful. Your creative energy, your physical energy, the spiritual energy, the connectedness of the sex that you do have, all of that increases when you are consistently retaining semen. So yeah, big fan of that one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did a course, not ashamed to say it by a guy named Jonathan White. I might've, I might've sent him to you at some point, uh, but he yeah. teaches like sexual Kung Fu and Qigong and these, you know, Taoist prax, uh, practices. Um, or Taoist practices. And yeah, it's, um, it's super powerful. I mean, I'm not against, I'm actually not against, um, masturbation. If it's basically the, the purpose of masturbation has to be getting in touch and in tune and in understanding with your own sexual energy as a man or as a woman, mm -hmm. and just kind of understanding, yeah. you know, your levels of arousal, um, before, entering it with, you know, another human. Um, so I, I think that it, there is actually a healthy level of masturbation. There's obviously, it's obviously dangerous because it's a slippery slope and it can take you to addiction. But I think that if you do it in the right way and you learn enough and then you bring it into the bedroom with a girl that you actually care about, that you could actually see yourself with long-term. Um, and you're essentially just cognizant of that energy, right? Like if you notice, okay, like this week, you know, I, I let it out. Uh, I didn't retain like four or five times and I'm tired and I'm lazy and I'm not productive. Yeah. Yep. Um, then maybe bring it down to like twice a week or once a week, whatever. But the rest of the times you can still have sex every single day. <laughs> yeah. You can't multiple times a day and actually yep. not ejaculate. And retain all of that energy within you because it's just funny that like people don't get it. Like that seed inside of you is a capacity to create a human. It's fucking nuts. And like my, my friend recently had a baby and it's just like, wow, that actually happens. Like you, that stuff that most guys are just <laughs> dumping down the toilet, like wasting, that can create it, putting a, a human. Tissue. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's yeah, actually so a spiritual sin to waste that uh, if you're not creating uh, life in some religions, it's forbidden. Interesting. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think there has to be some, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I just think it does, there's no such thing as like an, a, an ultimate rule, right? Like every, every um rule can have some exception. And, um, and I think semen retention is one of them. Like there's, there's times where it's right. I think probably the vast majority of times it's probably right. And there's times where it's not. Um, I also think that, you know, as probably as people get older, like sex is uh, not as, uh, as important as we think it is when we're younger. <laughs> um, but it's certainly something that I think a lot of people aren't harnessing. It's, you know, the, the power that it can create, you know, you're, you're in the process of lovemaking and it's, it's creating an extremely powerful energy field. And that energy you can take into your work, you can take into just your relationships, you can take and hold within you, you know, anywhere. And it, it makes you magnetic. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's something that is worth guys exploring, like these, you know, ancient, pre- there's a reason it's been around for thousands of years, but just beyond like not yeah. watching porn, I think there's, there's more that guys can explore. Hundred percent. And what is important to realize? People think that you're like somehow depriving yourself by doing this. It's like okay, yeah. less often you are experiencing the seven to eight seconds of localized penis pleasure <laughs> when you're ejaculating. Mm-hmm. But what else that leads to, if you do not have that, is like a much more passionate flow of sexual energy in the rest of the sex that you're having a higher sex drive, a more like animalistic desire and literal spiritual capacity to connect with your girl in the rest of the sex that you're having. So yeah, you're forgoing that seven to eight second window, but everything else that you access is a high level of sex, a high level of energy uh, in everything else. So it's like, you're not giving up anything. You're only unlocking all these benefits. Mm. Let's discuss a bit of... Like people wanted, I think, you know, more health related things as well. Um, I think that's, you know, one of your signatures, certainly. And I'm definitely passionate about it. I want to ask you about like, um, cause we actually have met in person. You've got great hair, dude. What's the secret to, Thanks, man. to, to great hair for men? And for oh, it's women. like anything great skin, great hair, uh, great hair is from great health and, Anything external that looks good is because the internal looks good. You have appropriate amount of nutrition, all the building blocks that make up hair, amino acids, collagen uh, being the primary ones. Um, But so hair specifically, I think a lot of guys are um, have thinning hair because their hormones are out of whack. And, you know, what happens when you put a lion or any animal in a cage in a zoo? Uh, They start to lose their feathers. They start to lose their hair. It's the same kind of thing. If a man is under stress at work, uh, he's not getting sunlight. He's under these fluorescent lights all the time. He's eating shitty food, empty of nutrients. Uh, His blood flow is completely fucked because he's sucking on his nicotine vape all the time. Uh, Caffeine as well as a vasoconstrictor. So you're having that all the day. You're not getting enough blood flow to your scalp. Uh, you're not sweating every single day. You're not purging yourselves of toxicities. Um, all of these things basically contribute to a state where your body isn't operating uh, to the level that it could. So, yeah, it's 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 all those things that I mentioned. Another big one is uh, masturbating too much, ejaculating too much. The prolactin that raises in your body after ejaculation um, at a consistent level, if you're doing it like you know, once a day, have my nightly jack off. It's like, that's a lot of guys these days. And then their hair is thinning because they're constantly in a, in a, let's say unnatural uh, hormonal state. Not to mention that semen itself is full of nutrients, minerals, zinc, uh, and requires a lot of energy to create. So you are depleting your body of that energy and those nutrients because uh, that would otherwise go to fulfilling your hair. Uh, And so it's like, yeah, getting outdoors, low stress, eating a good quality, nutritious diet, uh, sunlight, not jacking off, <laughs> not ejaculating all the time. Uh, and then as far as the actual hair care, 
I like obviously combing is a big one. I use a wood comb. Uh, growing it long, you have to comb it, you know, four four times a day when you get up before bed. It helps to smooth out all the oils and evenly distribute them, all the natural oils. Shampoo is a big one. Glad I remembered that one. A lot of people are using shampoo, uh, which is, you know, essentially chemical toxic sludge in the shower every day. Oh, my hair's getting a little bit oily or I went to the gym. I need to completely soak my head and scalp in this, um, you know, effectively Unilever company mass corporation owned uh, chemical sludge, which has like got all these fake artificial uh, fragrances preservatives you just read the ingredients in like the links fucking all in one body wash and head wash it's it's garbage and it's not real and it's like poisonous to your body and when you're applying that directly to your scalp all the time not only are you washing out all of the natural oils that your body produces to protect and keep the hair healthy you are like soaking it in this chemical wash which eventually just kills the hair itself and impacts the scalp so I don't wash my hair with anything other than, you know, natural olive oil soap on occasion um, or just, you know, because I'm by the ocean, I can go in there and, and just scrub it like physically with my hands and make sure that sweat and stuff is getting out um, as well as doing that in the shower so that I am never putting that chemical goop on the hair itself, combing all the time, all those other things I mentioned and, um but there was one other thing yeah if if you if it's a little bit dry then you can put a little bit of coconut oil uh mixed through it and that gives it a nice shine you can also look at doing a raw egg uh mask in your hair so you whip up some raw eggs and put that in your hair for 10 minutes or so and then rinse it out with with cold water because of all the beneficial nutrients in eggs that actually ends up being really nice to your hair and making it all silky what about water quality? Like, uh, I know you yep. mentioned at one point you had a um, filter. Yeah. Where do people find that? How much does it cost? What does that do? Yeah. So um, I have it. If people go to my Instagram, it's on like, I think I have a story highlight called Soul Recommendations or whatever. And that's the shower filter that I use. It's the most powerful one that I could find. And you just attach this to most shower heads. And um, then the shower head goes on the other side of it. But a lot of the reason why people have hair and skin problems is because they're showering every day in tap water. People in general know that tap water is bad, but they then don't think that they like the, the connection isn't made in their head between tap water uh, and shower water, but it's coming from the same water source. So a shower filter takes out chlorine, fluoride, particularly this shower filter takes out fluoride. Not all shower filters do. That's why I use this one. Um, so it's a bit of a beast, but all of these other chemicals that can, you know, chlorine itself is like the biggest risk, risk, fa uh, risk factor for cancer. And is a lot of the reason like chlorinated water is so bad. Fluoride, that's a whole other topic uh, is why they put fluoride in the water. They say it's the teeth health. It's not, but it's actually poisonous in the form that they put it in the water supply. So you have to, you know, one, avoid tap water to drink, but then also realize that when you're showering, that's like, the equivalent of drinking eight glasses of tap water, the average shower and the way that your skin is absorbing it and soaking into your body. So filtering that water makes a massive difference to your scalp health, probably acne as well, because you're not dousing yourself in um, yeah, chemical hot water. Mm. Do you have, um, I mean, I'm sure there's, uh, there's like sleep is something that affects hair health as well now. Sleep affects everything. So like anything that's going to impact um, sleep is going to impact any aspect of health and anything that impacts your health is going to affect your skin, hair and all the rest of it. Mm. That's you why you any, can't um, like put recommendations um, for supplements that people might be able to uh, purchase. <laughs> yes. Well, Obviously, we know my brand, soulsups.com, soul supplements. And um, on there, we in stock at the moment, we have the soul salts, which are uh, a natural electrolyte supplement, which you can add to your water. It's going to support uh, actual heat hydration uh, of the cells because you need the minerals in order to move the water that you drink into the body. If you actually drink empty water, shall we say, 
through the principle of osmosis, uh, you're going to lose water uh, and you're not going to get it into the body. So the natural electrolytes are really great. It's essentially just uh, a mix of salt and a bit of magnesium and, you know, lots of reviews there for you to check out. Uh, everyone loves it. Uh, the bison liver as well is a, is a really important one. Uh, liver in general, but bison liver has better nutrient qualities than uh, a, a lot of other livers. So, yeah, it's freeze dried, pasteurized, raised, nothing artificial, nothing else in it, grass fed, of course, the highest quality stuff. And uh, yeah, liver itself as a as a food is the most in, you know most nutrient dense food on the planet you can get. And so these freeze dried capsules are just like a little booster that you can add to. Um, booster has negative connotations, but yeah, that's a nutrition boost. Glycine, we're out of stock till the end of the year, unfortunately, but that's another another big one. Wow. A lot of people have taken advantage of that. That's cool. It's yeah. good to see. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, guys, check out, definitely go check out soulsubs.com. I definitely need to pick up some. Um, what's the I'll shipping time look like? Depends where you are. Where you are, they'll be there in, you know, a couple of days easy ah okay sweet yeah I'll, I'll pick some up for sure um cool. epic and let's see oh i know what i wanted to talk about so let's say you've got a girl you watch soul bra you listen to soul bra and you want your girlfriend to be more based what do you how do you do that what's that process look like so this is just a result of you being the masculine leading figure in the relationship and slowly introducing things that you know are good for you, that you do, that show quality results for your, yourself in your own life. Um, and then she just by you know osmosis and respecting your opinion and being around you uh, and you showing her things and doing it in a fun way and a non-judgmental way, that's super important as well. Uh, and eventually, you know, hopefully, if the right masculine feminine dynamic is there, she will pick up on what you're doing. Hopefully, want to make you happy and feel better as a result of all these health practices, diet stuff, exercise. Uh, and then as well, there's like the political stuff that we were talking about more so at the start of this, this um, talk where you can explain things to her as like, oh, this is why, uh, you know, this is bad and so on and so forth. And why I, I don't think that there's necessarily much value in your girl being super political uh, for a long-term relationship to flourish. She has to be on the same page as you. And I, one of the qualities that I looked for was someone that was like fiercely against that stuff as well, because, you know, Lord forbid anything happened to me you have to consider that your wife is going to raise your children. It may be you're in the picture or not in the picture. Maybe you're away from home for a while. It's like they, their abilities to communicate what you would want your son to know as well. And at that point, you know, they have to have some innate resistance to government programming. They have to, you know, a lot of guys mention how do I get my girl off birth control? And that it starts with education with a lot of things like, hey, did you actually know that birth control is bad for you? And this is why. And then, um, you know, doing a test run and, and, and being supportive in that way and, and just being the vehicle that your girl can feel safe in pursuing new objects. You know, the feeling of safety is really important. And if you judge her for not doing it straight away, that can lead to resentment. And so will not mm. desire, not get to what you desire. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just showing, showing them what you're doing, showing the results, having fun with it. And with time, you know, hopefully there will be some ad adoption of those values. If not, and the values are so far away from anything and there's no progress being made, then, you know, maybe you relook at whether you guys should be together. Yeah, I think uh, I have a pretty, I have a pretty wild um, analogy that people may react funny to in the comments, but uh, here it comes. So, I think I think a lot of men get frustrated if they have a girlfriend if they make a suggestion and she doesn't follow that suggestion instantaneously. 
because as men, right, we we're much different. Uh, male nature is like, Hey soul, like you're doing that form wrong, fix it. Right. Or like, you know, you're a pussy yeah. get in the gym, right? Like it's, we're motivated by we negativity that. and yeah. And we, we also, we can, we can be ready for battle right away. You know, like we, we can yeah. make a quick impulsive decision. And a lot of it comes down to actually, it's just, it's male biology. When men get turned on, they are quite literally erect and like immediately, and they're ready to pass on their genes to the next generation. Yeah. Because that's what's uh, evolution has programmed us to do. Whereas women, on the other hand, have a slower warm up, and I'm going to getting you know more graphic here. Like the vagina is <laughs> a, an organ, an organ. You know, it's part of the body that is very slow to warm up so to speak. Yes. And, and, and it's the same with female nature for a man to convince his woman or to try to convince his woman to get off birth control or to start working out, taking care of her health, stop watching this polluting thing that's polluting your mind. He can't get frustrated if she's not erect immediately, <laughs> you know, yeah, like she's, yeah. she's going to take time to get there. And I think if men are more understanding of that part of female nature and more supportive and like you said, providing a feel, feeling of safety, then that's ultimately, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast in that sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting because it uh, it's kind of the same with sex specifically is guys can kind of just like see some titties and then they're like, okay, let's go. You know, <laughs> we're on. But girls, girls, sex starts the moment that the previous sex session finishes. So think about that for a second. Mm. The, the slow buildup and affection and the emotions that they're existing in and their feeling of safety and security and passion, it can be that can build up when you kiss them in the morning before you go to work, the compliments that you give them, the touches that you give them, all of that might not necessarily be like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm getting turned on. But it does put the woman in that state where she is emotionally ready to be sexual. And if that safety isn't there, if she feels uncomfortable in her own skin, if like you can't just expect your girl to be boom, ready to go every single time like the guys, because that's just not how women work. And if you are purely operating from a physical standpoint, um, then you're going to run into some issues down the line with that. And this, uh, like you're saying, the same thing uh, goes for trying to get them to do something new is you have to slowly expose them to like, okay, uh, you know, vegan girlfriends is a, is a thing that happens. Is like my girl's vegan. How do I get her to get meat? She's going to have raw liver straight away. So don't be, don't be offended at that. But if one night you're like, hey, come around on Friday, I've got some beautiful grass-fed steaks and I'm going to cook them just us and we're going to have a dinner together and you can try a bit. And then that's the start if she's open to that. And before, obviously, you would, you would, you would set the scene by saying, hey, did you know that there's amino acids that you can't get from any other food apart from meat? And did you know that the protein in meat is much more bioavailable than any vegan protein. And they'd be like, hmm, that's interesting, cool. And then don't mention anything until the next week. And then you you layer it and so on and so forth. And it's like, you know, it's similar to like, you can't tell someone that the queen is a pedophile, the straight up, but you can say like, hmm, wasn't it interesting how she defended uh, Prince Andrew when he was a bit, you know, strange with, with those people? And it's like, okay, I didn't know that, but rather than having someone drop their <laughs> drop their fork at the dinner table they're like hmm that is interesting so it's the same yeah. principle yeah i probably hmm. should have started with uh with epstein yeah. huh yeah yeah something <laughs> so <laughs> where can i go if i want to look like just overall more attractive to women where can you go yeah what what can i wear <laughs> well i have heard of this brand called uh soul apparel it's the oh, website really? i believe is soul apparels with an s.com 
Uh, oh, wow. We've had, yeah, I mean, look at all the ladies who love you in, in those shorts and, you know, some cool <laughs> T-shirts and tanks down there. 100% cotton, of course. Everything I put out is never going to have any polyester or any of those petroleum-based um, endocrine-disrupting materials in there. So everything you get from us is going to be, you know, great. You can wear it without underwear and, and feel good. Your body's going to feel good with it. So check it out, solarparels.com. That's my brand, and we're going to be doing good things. And it's pretty much, I think, the like one of the only 4.5-inch inseam cotton shorts, 100% cotton shorts that you can get um full mm. stop that i've seen um and people love it like pretty much always out of stock when we do drops so yeah you can wear them i've worn them in the gym in the ocean in water um in the sauna they're comfy for everything just chilling as well at the house sick i love it yeah Healthy. and i think a lot of people don't understand that a lot of clothing can actually like you said endocrine disruptors um yeah, well, most gym wear, so it's polyester, right? It's polyester. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of different compounds that are unstable uh, carbon compounds that are made from petroleum. And it's essentially wearing plastic on your body and then you're heating up throughout the day whether you're going to the gym or sweating or whatever. The skin being a porous organ means that you're absorbing anything that's on your skin. So you're getting these microplastics consistently throughout your body. This guy texted me just before. He said... That I don't know what it was with polyester, but every time, every ever since I was wearing this the sole shorts, uh, my libido's gone through the the roof, and that's that's you know his message that I just got. I'm not even saying that, but it's because his testicles, where your hormones are being <laughs> your hormones are being affected by the plastic um in your gym shorts or yoga pants or whatever women as well infertility can happen from having plastic around that area uh and absorbed through the skin so i think that's the biggest one if i can design a yoga pant that is natural fiber materials that is like game changer because think pretty much every girl has a pair of yoga pants whether for the gym or uh or just chilling like if i can hack that then it's game over I love it. Was there anything else in your notes that you really wanted to cover? Um, now we pretty much copped everything, actually. Yeah, I think we covered. I mean, we covered a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Uh, maybe one thing I've got here, so I'll just add it in as well, is um, a place to live. So I get asked like where should I settle down? Where's a good place to live or a worse place to live or whatever. So it, you have to think about yourself and the uniqueness, uniqueness of you, who you are, where you're at in life. If I had to pick, you know, it's a type of place that is good for you rather than a place itself. So let's put it this way. What are your goals? If you want to be the best horse rider in the world, then the best place for you would be some isolated cattle ranch where you'd be riding a horse all day in turbulent conditions like this small town in Texas. There's no distractions. There's no nightlife or whatever. But if you want to be a, a great real estate agent, then you need to be somewhere where a lot of people are moving to. So it's all about finding a place that's going to give you the most opportunity and the most leverage for what you want to do. Now, for most people, that is a big city for the moment uh, of entrepreneurs uh, for young guys who want to make a name for themselves, you have to be in a place where things are happening, where you're going to go to a gym where other high value people are and, and get to talking in the sauna. That is just not going to happen in a lot of the smaller towns that you are growing up with in. And it's part of the reason why I, I moved away from Australia uh, and I'm in America now is because the business culture, the lifestyle culture is just completely different over there to what it is here and my opportunities were much more here as well as you know the freedom aspect and the things that i love and and all the rest of it so i would say you know in general if you don't have an idea a big city uh but pre uh, a preference would be one with sun and nature still because big cities are pretty soul-sucking if you're just stuck in the concrete jungle kind of thing and you always need to consider your health if you can be somewhere near the ocean coastal cities in general are more happening and have that ability to to be in the water is really great so always be key 
you know, key to remember that you're going to absorb whatever energy you're around. Um, so if you feel good in a place, then it's likely that you're going to mesh with and have success there. Whereas if you just vibes feel off somewhere, whatever reason it is, trust the intuitive sense of yourself. And um, yeah, that, that can help. Like try a few different places, a few months here, a few months there. And I feel like where you, where you really mesh with or where your career is going. Yeah, I like that. I think another um, factor to consider is, I mean, you, you alluded to it, like just the people that are in that location and the, yeah. the mentality that they have, the belief systems that they structure their life through and um yeah you know being around being around uh i mean if a, a big trend that i'm noticing in circles that i'm in is a lot of young men are moving to dubai which i don't personally see myself making that move but from young men who i think young men who are single who basically all they want to do is build up as much capital as possible it makes yeah. a lot of sense you know, from what I've heard, and I haven't been to Dubai, but from what I heard, you know, everyone's there for the same reason. They want to make money. You go anywhere yeah. in the city, you meet anyone, they're going to be talking about business, they're going to have a business, and you're going yeah. to talk about business. Um, as opposed to, you know, a place more like, I mean, but like the downsides of Dubai in my eyes is like, you're lacking trees and forests yeah. and, you know, um, you know, some some of these things that I definitely are important to me. Um, that, and this was actually something perhaps we can close on this point is um, it's like alternative forms of wealth. Like we actually, we, we, you began smoking about this as well. Like men uh, are led to chase money. Um, but what's to say about money and wealth to me, like wealth is, going outside and breathing fresh air and being able to go mm -hmm. on a walk in the forest. Like yep. that's, that's wealth, you know, and you know, your, your life can end at any time. And I think having the ability to have those things in, in arm's reach, there's few places in the world where you can, where you can get that and also get, you know, the social connections that you want to build. But um, nature is something that's incredibly important to me. That's probably why I just, I don't think I could see myself in, in Dubai. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I wasn't a, I visited Dubai and yeah, go visit, but there's a weird energy. Like the beach is, is really nice and it's clean, but it's like, it's super built up. Like you said, there's no nature, but it's, it's very like, it just seems very artificial, um, sandy, very, very hot. And like, there's like if you have a lot of money it can be great but if you don't then i definitely would not live there a lot of like concrete skyscraper apartment buildings and this kind of a slave underclass of of immigrants and they're treated very poorly there and it's just like a weird vibe overall mm. um but yeah i i always like you want to live somewhere where you don't necessarily need money to have fun or just exist like somewhere with a high quality of life that you can go to the the beach there's good sun the the air is a good quality um there's nature around all of that is free and all of that is going to be the biggest bang for your buck even though you're not spending any money biggest bang for your buck investments in time for your health uh so if you have something that yeah you're you're getting those numbers uh, on the bank's hard drive that's increasing but if you're paying for it so to speak with a year of your life and sanity living in a concrete jungle city then like is that worth it to me you know there are, are bouts of that that you will probably have to do of, of grinding where you can still make it work but for that to be your default where you live that's just like nah and you won't have uh, the energy involved in order to be the best version of yourself to have the most entrepreneurial success if that's a constant drain that you're having. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, it, it is a shame. I like, I, the thing is like, obviously the zero tax thing is amazing. And I think the direction yeah. it's going politically is intelligent, like in, in that sense. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, is it worth the trade off? Is it worth it? If only there were a city 
that you could build. But maybe that's for another finally, time. Finally. <laughs> um, Soul, it's been absolutely amazing chatting with you today. I hope that everyone has enjoyed this and was able to gain something that shifts the paradigm that you're in. Closing thoughts from you. Yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Thanks for spending your time with us. Thank you, Alan, for having me. Glad we got to do this finally. And uh, yeah, everyone have a, a, a stunning day. Go get some sun and uh, sending you all good energy and love.